We're talking to Professor Horace Campbell, a professor of political science and African American studies at Syracuse University. It's very interesting what you're saying, because when he um, represented um, those who supported the coup in Honduras, when we saw the documents uh, released by WikiLeaks, the U.S. diplomatic cables, in fact, their analysis of what happened in Honduras was uh, dead on, this is an illegal coup that has taken place in Honduras. But it's not what Secretary Secretary of State Hillary Clinton or the president was saying on a regular basis, uh, Professor Campbell, do you see something yes. similar uh, happening right now in very Africa and the Ivory Coast? Very, very, very similar. In, in, in this case, um, Bagbo is trying to exploit differences between the State Department and the White House. The president of the United States called Lauren Bagbo to urge him to step down, and he was so arrogant that he refused to take the telephone call of President uh, Barack Obama, and he is he's arrogant enough to believe that he can whip up the kind of xenophobia to divide the people of uh, the Ivory Coast, to say that Alison Ouattara is not an Ivorian, that Alison Ouattara is from the North, he's a Muslim, and he's using all kinds of um, divisiveness that we have seen in that country, so that the people of the North, the people who are Islamic background, are being presented as non-Ivorians. I have no, I have no beef for Alison Watara, but the point is, the people voted for him, and the elections results should be observed. And the the, the positive result out of all of this is the clarity of the African Union, the fact that the African Union is taking a very clear position that Watara won the election. The African Union has taken a very clear position that they will use force. And the, the fact that the meeting of ECOWAS that took place two days ago would send a very clear signal so that there could be no manipulation within West Africa itself. I think this is part of the maturity of the African Union process. And we're going to need that process also in the Sudan in 9 to 11 days' time when we face a similar crisis in the Sudan. So the, what we, in this side of the world, have to do, we have to keep up our education to the citizens so that people like Lanny Davis and the State Department and the U.S. Africa Command cannot use incidents such as what is happening in the Ivory Coast to represent Africa as backward and divisive and barbarian. Professor Campbell, if you could look directly into the camera as you speak, but give us a thumbnail history of the Ivory Coast, a geopolitical history, how it got to this point. I think most people in the United States, so people are listening and watching now all over the world, um, uh, probably have very little idea uh, about uh, even where the Ivory Coast, where Cote d'Ivoire is. Okay. Well, the Ivory Coast was a jewel in the crown of French colonialism. The Ivory Coast, as by its very name, was a place where colonial plunder took ivory and gold. The Ivory Coast is located in West Africa, bordered by Liberia, bordered by um, Sierra Leone, and by by Ghana. Now, the president of the Ivory Coast, when Ivory Coast became independent in 1960, the president of Ivory Coast was Huifa Boine. Huifa Boine used the Ivory Coast as a base for counter-revolution in Africa. All of the forces of French colonialism, all of the forces of French exploitation, all of the forces of French militarism converged on the Ivory Coast, and for 30 or more years, the Ivory Coast was the base for supporting apartheid in South Africa. It was a base for supporting Jonas Savimbi. Jonas Savimbi was very close to the leader, Hope and Boyne. And um, some of your listeners would know that they were also um, complicit in the plot to assassinate Thomas Sankara in uh, Burkina Faso. Now, the fact is, because of the intensification of the investment in the, uh, the Ivory Coast in that period, in the 50-year period, millions of Africans 
went to work on banana and cocoa plantations. So that there were a number of people, persons from Burkina Faso, persons from Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Ghana who worked in that country. So if the country has 20 million persons, there are, there are 10 or a million more persons from the north of the country whose, whose ancestors came as migrant workers. Now, in the spirit of Pan-Africanism, one should recognize that the borders in the Ivory Coast were artificially created at the Conference of Berlin. Well, in, in 1993, after Ufoboyne passed away, uh, Halis Mutar was the prime minister. They wrote a Supreme Court judgment to say that those who are from the North were not Ivorian citizens, and Halis Mutar, whose mother was supposedly was born in the Burkina Faso, could not become a candidate for the presidency. Now, between 1999 and 2000, Bagbo himself ran in an elections, and when he won the elections, the general who was the head of the army um, said that Bagbo could not come to power. You know, Bagbo himself organized so that he could come to power, and there was a civil war in the country between 2000 and 2004 which, again, brought about the intervention of South Africa and the African Union. In that intervention, the African Union worked to overturn that judgment of the Supreme Court that said that persons from the North could not be citizens. And this idea is a sentiment that is whipped up in the country called Ivorite. Ivorite is a chauvinistic notion. It is an anti-Pan-African notion. It's a notion that says only those who are Christians from the southern area of the country can be citizens. Now, this is not something that is um, carried by the majority of the citizens of the Ivory Coast. This is an idea that is whipped up by the elements of the Ivorian capitalist class. These are Ivorians who have made millions of dollars out of cocoa plantation, out of exploiting the workers in the Ivory Coast. So up to 2005, there was another election, and the Bagbo has been negotiating about... Professor Campbell? Let's go to a break. We'll try to get him back on to finish this uh, in-depth look at the Ivory Coast and what's happening there, with 14,000 people fleeing the Ivory Coast as the president, after an election, has refused to step down. Uh, it's believed several hundred people have been killed, disappeared. We will continue to follow the story. Professor Campbell speaking to us from North Carolina, where there is a state of emergency, although he describes something like three inches of snow on the ground, uh, where he is in Winston-Salem. Uh, he's a professor at Syracuse University. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.